Deputy on Tuesday, the 31st of January 2023. For the webcast, my name is Helen Gain and I'll be your chairman today. To my right is my Vice Chair, Councillor David Wixley. To his right is Gary Woodall from and uh, Vivian Messenger from Democratic Services, Tom Kahn, and uh, the lady who is actually looking after the webcast, Rebecca Morton. To my left, it's Andrew Small, it's uh, Ben Johnson from Collis, Georgina uh, Blackmore, and, uh, and Shasha Jevans. Okay, you've got the whole panel now. <laughs> well, let's start with the webcasting notice. Gary, could you please take us through that? Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing, with copies of the recording being made available for those that request it. By being present at this meeting, it is likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part of the broadcast. You should be aware that this may infringe your human and data protection rights, and if you have any concerns, then please speak to the webcasting officer. Please could I also remind members and officers to activate their microphones before speaking and deactivate them when they've finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item two, apologies for absence, Vivian. Chair, I've um, received apologies from councillors Baldwin and Bob Jennings. Okay, uh, Vivian, item three, any substitute members? Yes, Councillor Brooks is substituting for Councillor Baldwin. Okay, thank you. Item four, declarations of interest. Councillor Bassett. Thank you, Chairman. Obviously, as a non-executive director of Qualis, I must declare that. But with your permission, I'd like to stay and uh, listen to the discussion for my information. Yes, of course. Okay, right, item five, members, we've got the minutes of two different uh, uh, meetings. It's the 3rd and the 17th, 17th of November, 2022. Now, on the meetings of the 3rd of November, if you turn on your page eight, uh, we actually put on First, uh, 43, paragraph 43, transfer of service to Corliss. Uh, you can see it says that uh, uh, Andrew Small introduced the report which pro proposed to transfer the service on the 1st of April 2023. But it was not on the 1st of April. It was a little bit later. I think it was 17th, as we can see later on in the agenda. So what we've done is we actually redrafted, we changed the minutes to say in April 2023. So we're covering instead of putting a specific date. Okay? But from that, is there anything else that you have? Any questions on any remarks, any comments? Or shall we agree the minutes? Agreed, thank you. Um, so we go to the minutes of the um, 17th of November. The same here. Any comments, any remarks, or shall we agree? The minutes, please. Agreed? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we've got any matters arising and outstanding actions that they are not covered in any agenda? No, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, item seven, public questions and requests to, uh, to address this committee. Gary? No, we haven't received any, Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Item eight, executive decisions, any call in? Again, Chairman, no decisions have been called in. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we go to item nine, Qualis. Right, before we actually uh, uh, introduce, before I introduce our uh, 
the people that came in today to talk about Qolis and about, to answer questions about Qolis. I would like to bring to your attention that we had three emails from Councillor Murray. Uh, the two emails are actually, uh, I found them very interesting. One of the emails is about a private letter and I do not feel comfortable at all discussing here a private member, a private letter that was sent to a councillor. Despite the fact that it was, it, we received it, I do not feel comfortable at all, especially if there are implications and negotiations or any investigation uh, on its way. So I will not refer to that at all, and, uh, we'll, but the rest of the emails with the residents' ideas of the quality service, I actually uh, think it is very useful. Uh, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. I hadn't intended speaking at this stage, but you've obviously said what you've said. Uh, you're an excellent chairman of ONS. Uh, nothing but praise for the way in which you do the job. I have to say on, on this item, uh, I kind of disagree with you in, in one sense. I completely agree that it has to be dealt with sensi sensitively. But once that letter uh, has been released, I would argue that it's no longer a, uh, a private letter. And though I fully accept that the, any detailed discussion and any detailed consideration uh, would have to be done in part two, I don't accept that the, the, the general points of concern are not a legitimate uh, public matter. So I'm, I'm, I'm t telling you now, or, and you might want to not allow me a call, so I accept that, but when we do get to item nine uh, and we're discussing the body of it, uh, I, I do intend to, to refer to the letter in a very general sense. Not in a detailed sense, uh, but there are some very serious uh, concerns that rise from that letter. And I don't think I will be the only one who thinks that. Uh, and I don't think that there is any harm. In fact, I would go further. I think there is a duty on us uh, to... Uh, to uh, uh, the general points uh, to make sure that they are uh, aired and, and aired publicly, I have to say. But you, if you want to rule me out of order when we get to that, you'll have to rule me out of order and uh, obviously I will have to accept your uh, ruling. Well, I will just say from uh, straight now that this was not a release letter. This was a letter private sent to you uh, it was not sent to me, it was sent to me and other members by, by yourself. So there is, uh, the, there is an element of legalities here and I have quite a lot of experience on that and I will not agree to actually refer to that, I will not allow that. I will ask actually uh, Georgina to, uh, say, to, to say any different. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, the message from myself isn't different. The, the letter is um, being investigated. The investigation isn't complete. Um, and if we debate in the chamber, then we are potentially putting the council at risk. We've t taken monitoring officer advice on that. And, and I would um, fully support the chair in the uh, statements made. Thank you. So I'm sorry to say that this letter will not be mentioned in this chamber. I don't wish to pursue the matter, but I'm just saying, repeating what I've said, you'll have to hear what I want to say when the time comes, and I want to hear what other members have to say, uh, and you'll have to rule me out of order at that time. But I do believe that there are general points that can be made, and I have also been led to believe, and it's only by third hand, I have to accept that, I've all so being led to believe oh, that the author of the letter is more than happy that it is now in, out in the open. But I haven't heard that directly from the author of the letter, uh, but I have heard that from someone who would know. Uh, and, uh, and the author of the letter is, 
uh, you know, I have been told he's more than happy that it's uh, in, out in, in public. In this case, if you still insist of actually talking about it, which I actually say that there are legalities and implications, and I am very well, uh, you know, experienced on HR and uh, a lot of tribunals and things like that. So I, I think that if you insist on actually going through this letter, we will do it on a private session. I will not allow that to be back. Now, Chairman, let me clarify. I do not intend going through the letter. I intended making just a general statement about the letter. So I, there may not be a great deal of difference in, in, in where we're coming from. Uh, I didn't intend to uh, speak at this stage, but obviously you said what you said. Uh, let's just say that when we get to it, whether you're happy in the approach that I'm, I'm taking, it will, not be a, uh, uh, it will not be a detailed reference to the content of the letter. I promise you that. Okay, thank you. All right, so we go to item nine, which is uh, Wallace. It was, uh, I think it was uh, the right time, uh, upon reflection on several different meetings, uh, that uh, I had the, 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 the feeling, and uh, everybody said exactly the same, that the councillors are not feeling very comfortable about qualities. They have questions that they are not answered. And we're concentrating on housing repairs, but uh, we've got here uh, Sasha Jevons and uh, Ben Johnson, who are willing to actually answer, to tell us a little bit more about qualities and to answer our questions. So I'll give it to you, Ben. Uh, sorry, Sasha. Yeah, just to um, say, quality management was set up in September 2020, so we're now into our third year of operation. And the council decided to set up Collis when the nine-year, for those of you who remember, the nine-year Mears contract came to an end. And so they felt that it would be better to set up their own company with control over the repairs and maintenance um, service. So what we're going to do tonight is go through how we, um, what services we provide in Collis, a bit more detail around that. Um, how we deal with customer complaints and our customer satisfaction, how we look at performance and manage that, and just give you a bit more detail around the operation of Qualis Management. And, uh, ben, and then hopefully um, answer, answer your questions after that. So Ben Johnson's going to take us through a presentation that should give you a lot more detail than maybe you've heard before about the operation of Qualis Management. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, so, yeah, good to meet you all. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm Managing Director of Property um, Qualis Management. Um, just in terms of the agenda, so I'm going to give, go through a bit about our capability, what we deliver, uh, talk a bit about our values and what we hold dear, um, talk around complaints and lessons learned, as I think that's really important because we don't always get it right. Um, talk about our performance. So when I talk about performance, that's our 21-22 performance. So that runs from September to October. Um, so, so that's the, the sort of financial year that we work to. A um, bit about how the council monitors our performance and then a little bit around the future and the key objectives over the next 12 months. So just starting with um, what we deliver. Um, so actually this this uh, graphic came off the back of um, um, some feedback from Councillor Whitbread around, make it very clear around what's within Qualis and what's within the Council. Cause, and I know it's a little bit small, but I'll, I'll read through that. Um, so we do all the general repairs outside and inside um, of the homes, including the communal areas. Um, most more recently, we've done gas heating breakdown repairs. So that started last year, the 1st of April. Um, and the, the annual gas safety checks. Um, we do electrical safety checks, um, and we also do the void properties, so empty properties, um, preparing them um, for EFDC to then, to then let. Um, we also do the planned work, so kitchens, bathrooms, electrical rewires, uh, and we have our own um, area for feedback, which I'll talk through in a moment, and those are the, the general ways that you can contact us. 
Um, so the council still holds a number of um, services on the housing side, so major works, plan works, so things like window replacements, front doors, um, complete roof replacements and, and estate regeneration. Um, any properties with major structure issues um, get referred um, to, the, to the housing asset team. And um, a lot of the and if there's any alterations that need to be done to the home, that is the other area that um, goes through the council. State and lands uh, and grounds maintenance. Um, and the, we've got the AIDS and ADAPT service as well through OT service. Um, obviously, tenancy and housing inquiries, rent and home ownership. So that, that's the general sort of split, which is, is quite helpful um, for, for customers to see. But it's ju just as a way as a, of a reminder, really. So that's our services. Um, in terms of the resources, so a little bit of a recap there. So currently we have 75 members of staff in, in the team. And one of the key things when we set up was around uh, trying to do as much as possible in-house uh, and providing that local employment and opportunities. So th this, is kind of, this is the split, an indicative split of how we deliver at the moment. So most responsive repairs are delivered by in-house teams. So that's around 80% of those are delivered in that way. Um, currently voids, um, we do 25% and 75% we, we, we outsource, but we're looking to look at ways that we can increase uh, the, the amount we do in-house on that particular item. Um, gas is mainly delivered in-house um, for our, our own teams that chupied in <coughs> from um, the former contractor, and um, we have a mixed economy on the electrical testing, so we have some in-house staff um, and some outsource. Some of that is driven around um, challenges around resourcing and, and availability within the market uh, for for trades, which is, you know, there are shortages um, in, in, the, in the sector around that. So that's our resources. Um, we have a dedicated contact centre which um, operates in the daytime, in, in the evening. Um, me is actually, we bolt into the council service there, so they do our out of hours. So in the team, we have um, a team leader, and we have six members of staff, two of which are, are, are part time. One of the things that we um, did this time last year was we brought in a new piece of software called Amazon Connect. Um, so that is, um, is the same company that you do shopping through. So we brought that in as a web-based product. So a number of things that that brought with it. So web chat being a very recent addition. So in the last few months, we've um, offered that as an option to customers. Um, we've also got an innovative um, callback feature. So essentially, you can choose to press number one. It will then hold your place in the queue, um, and then you don't lose your place, and it will then call you automatically back once you've moved through the, the, the queuing system. So that, that's been very helpful uh, in times where we've been extremely busy, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, we also do quality monitoring, so all of our calls are recorded. Um, and we do, we do grading and scoring around the sentiment of um, uh, staff and how they're dealing with the customer. So just to give you some com context, so we do almost uh, just over 24,000 repairs per year, uh, sorry, not repairs, sorry, calls per year. Um, so we do get quite a high volume through. Um, and then the other, the other item is around customer experience. Um, so we have a dedicated uh, member of the team who deals with complaints, looks at feedback, <coughs> understand the trends and what's, what's going on uh, within the teams and in the service. So that's, that's a bit about our resource. Just as a, a very high level reminder around um, the model that we've got, so uh, the SLA model. So it was based on uh, historic pricing that the, the council was in, enjoying previously. So some of that was with MIRS, some of that was with, with other contractors, as, as Sasha says. So uh, the three key areas I've just focused on here. So repairs, if you look at that, um, so we look after the 6,253 homes. So historically, the council was paying £452 per property. Um, we're at currently, although that's going to move with inflation shortly, um, we're at 420. So we actually, on those, so where it's between 420 and 600, that's at our risk. Okay. 
Okay, so we take all repairs up to that. And typically what they are is more <coughs> minor repairs, so it could be changing a tap, changing a washer, um, I'm picking lots of plumbing, but minor sort of repairs um, w within the properties. Where we go over £600, that requires approval from, from the council uh, in terms of the model, and I'll share with you what some of those type of repairs are. A uh, similar model with voids, so historically it was 5,300 the council were paying. So qualities take the risk actually on the revenue repairs from five free up to 10 grand. Um, so that's at our risk, so it's, a, it's a kind of risk reward um, uh, mechanism if you like. And then anything over 10 grand um, is then on approval and additional cost to EFDC. Uh, and then finally the gas, so that was at 195 and uh, we deliver that at 100. 171, um, but there's a mechanism for approving anything like a replacement boiler um, if it's beyond economical repair. So that's kind of the, that's the, the, the very basic um, model um, that we operate. Um, these are just a couple of examples of some of the categories we get around the over 600. So this is actually on communal repairs. So. Often it could be that there's a more major repair that's needed on a roof, you know, a, a section that needs replacing on a flat roof, for example, or we need to do a line of, you know, a longer line of fencing. So that's that's the type of repairs that fall into uh, outside of the model um, in terms of um, spend. And then it's a similar picture. So this is a, um, a, a pie chart that shows the houses. So within the dwelling. So again, it's things like fencing, roofing. Uh, if we had to replace a whole bath and toilet pan, that would fall in the over 600. So there's, there's things that are included and there's other items that are, are excluded within the model. So I hope that gives you a, a slight flavour of things. Um, just moving to our values, so these are really important. So um, all of our staff um, every three months are assessed on our values. So we, we refer to them, I suppose, internally as behaviours that we're looking for from our staff. Um, and this is, this is really how we you know, drive the, the, the culture within the business. Um, so being customer focused is, is clearly important. And we have multiple customers, not just tenants that are customers. You know, the council is one of our customers. Um, and we've got numbers of stakeholders as well. Uh, taking personal ownership is really important and that's something we want to instill within our staff when, when, when people join us and when we recruit. So thinking commercially, so that's not always about the money side of things, it's about how we can add value, how can we do things smarter, how can we be more innovative within the service that we're delivering and I've got a couple of examples of things we've changed as a result of that and then working a, a, as one team. So th those are our values and we develop those with staff um, and um, uh, throughout the organisation. Right, just moving then to customer feedback. So we undertake um, just over 17,000 repairs, so that was between October and September last year. I think it's really important to acknowledge we won't always get it right. Um, and like any service company, there will be failures. And it's about us trying to minim minimise the, the times that we fail um, in the context of, of the service that we deliver. So we're not perfect, but what I want to engender within our staff is a culture of actually continuous improvement. So that, that's a really important thing. So with that volume of repairs, there will be times when we, we get it wrong. Um, and I'll talk about, and I'll give a, a few examples of things that we've changed as a result of that. What I would say, though, is we do, in the main, get it right, and we get, so last year we were at 93% satisfaction. And that's on a return, so we get return around 22%, which might sound low, but actually, in the sector, that's pretty good in terms of the, 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 the feedback. The other thing that uh, the council is also doing as part of the HRA is um, so part of regulation they'll be doing a, their own annual survey as well so that will help to supplement as we move, move forward um, in, in time. Um, we also get some really good compliments, um, so just over a thousand compliments so that is 6.4% um, of the total repairs completed. 
Um, and we had 88 complaints uh, last year, so that was 0.5 of the total repairs completed. And it's, it's most likely that councillors in, in this chamber will hear about the, the, the negative stuff, and that, that's unfortunately and less likely to hear about uh, the more positive things. So I always, I always sort of um, say that to councillors. Um, so in terms of our complaints, so we're, we're, we're answering within time and we're very keen, we, we really want to encourage people to feed back to us because actually if, if we can then deal with those things and learn from those, that's the really important thing is to learn and, and develop our teams from that. So that, that's, that's a bit about what we deliver there. Um, and I think it's fair to say, so when we've looked at complaints, um, these are the three main causes of complaints are around length of time to complete. Um, and you may see some of those comments coming through on Facebook and, and, and other channels. So that, that's something we're very conscious about. Some of that is about us getting the right resource, uh, right recruitment and um, dealing with those in a timely manner. There's also been, we have had issues with material supplies uh, and that has been uh, an issue for, for most maintenance suppliers. So, and we've got some examples of how we try to mitigate that as much as possible. But it hasn't been perfect. You know, there are times when we have struggled to get certain parts or, or materials because of supply chain issues. And communication, um, well, I think that's common to any, anyone who's in a service uh, industry. Comms is always where it, it generally goes wrong. So that is our other area for, for, for focus. So there's a little case study here. So just to give you an example. So yeah, it goes wrong sometimes and it, you know, we need to learn from those. So a customer called in and said that you know, the heating isn't getting up to temperature. So they essentially had partial heating. Um, and our call operative, they didn't ask about the vulnerability, which is really important. Because if there's particular vulnerabilities, then obviously they need to be seen to first, because it's about prioritising those in, in most need with, with the resource that we have. So it got put on a 10-day repair. So the customer wasn't happy. They put a Google review on and contacted the council. But what didn't happen was they didn't make a formal complaint with us, so we didn't know. We resolved it, so we resolved it that afternoon and got somebody out. Um, and the outcome of that is, you know, it was about further training for the, the, the call handler, monitoring as well of that call handler for a period to make sure that they're asking that important question. Some other examples that we've got. So these are more general things that we've done around uh, improving uh, the service that we offer to customers. Um, so one was, so we, we were getting um, issues around delays, and this relates in part to the material side around glass uh, glazing on, on units. So, and, you know, I mentioned about innovation. So we're using a contractor now called Chris Clear. can actually repair the window from the outside where the window is misted up. Um, in the past, we would have taken that unit out. It would have ended up in landfill. So there, there's all sorts of benefits around that, but it can also be done from the outside of the property, which is then less um, disruptive to the, to the customer. So that's one example of something we've done fairly recently to try and um, help with that side of things. We also had feedback around the electrical testing and, the, and um, when people were phoning in, there wasn't an option. So there was, there was things that we added there. And we also changed the wording of the letters to make that clearer uh, and to give um, customers a clearer understanding of the times that would be required. So that was, that was directly from the complaint. Uh, and then probably quite a pertinent one is around the gas um, and heating supplies. So we have had some issues with uh, parts availability um, and following feedback and um, monitoring of the service, what we've done is added two additional suppliers and a process that if the repair is in jeopardy in effect, that we will then get the alternative supplier to provide that, um, which is a really important bit that we're not leaving customers waiting um, uh, unnecessarily. So th those are sort of three more general things. But I think it's, it's, it's important to acknowledge that we have had some challenges, um, certainly for the December period with the weather. Um, so we have had a very high demand for our service. Um, this is the first winter we've taken the service through um, since the transfer. Um, 
and the team have worked very hard um, to, to meet, meet the demand. Some of that is around um, people are actually been delaying putting their boilers on until that cold snap hit, which is really sad, um, but it's about, and what it's about is about affordability. So we kind of got hit with that plus, plus the weather. Um, it was very cold and we had uh, frozen condensed pipes, so a lot of call outs. So what happened in that period, and you know, I know there's a lot of detail there which you won't be able to see on the slide, but essentially the, the key thing is that our contact centre, the numbers doubled, so we had an extremely high demand for uh, people trying to call in. Um, plus we had a very high demand so for our out of hour service. So ordinarily we probably do seven or eight call outs per night, which can tip up in you know extreme weather if you get rain, heavy rain, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But you'll see here if you look at the sort of second bar, the Saturday of the 17th we had 88 um, call outs. And or ordinarily we have one person on, on gas breakdowns. We actually have five or six of our guys out there um, dealing with um, with, with the brake drowns and trying to, you know, keep everyone uh, uh, as warm as possible. So, yeah, that has impacted our performance. So moving to the performance, so as I say, this is uh, last financial year. Um, so these are the key areas that we actually monitor with our, with our board. And what you see in the first column there is uh, the, the previous financial year and um, the, the results for the financial year just gone. So it's kind of tracking that, that performance. And you can see some of that reflected in the, um, as I was saying about length of time, so the completions in time isn't at the target of 90, so that actually hit 84, but has got better. Um, the previous year was affected quite heavily by COVID and certainly worse material um, supply issues. Uh, customer satisfaction, as I said, 93%. Um, so we've talked that through. Productivity, so um, historically, I understand the council uh, service through Mears was delivering uh, two jobs per day. So actually, at the end of last year, we were at 3.7. So we've almost doubled the productivity uh, in that period. Um, first time fix is an important one, because actually what we want to do is arrive first time with the right parts on the van um, and uh, deliver that first time fix. So that's a really key thing that we, we, we want to monitor. Uh, and then gas compliance, very important around resident safety. Um, and that, that's been going well in terms of the servicing and making sure we get compliance for the council there. Um, on the voids, so at the end of uh, last financial year, so we were turning them around within target and also within 20 days. Um, so there are more now KPIs as service come on, on board, uh, which we, we monitor as, as we go forward. Um, and on that, in terms of how the, the council monitors our performance, um, so the, there is a monthly performance review meeting which is held between um, um, Jen and Pam's uh, heads of service and my heads of service. So they, they go through quite a few detailed uh, KPIs. Uh, which are within the SLA, which is the, the main contract uh, between ourselves and the council. So that's all monitored and, and talked through around the areas of improvement and, and, and where we're moving forward. Um, so we also have a quarterly strategic group, which actually we had today. So that's about the forward direction of how quality is performing. So it's a bit more strategic in um, how we're developing, um, you know, what's next, um, what are the areas of challenge. We look at risk. Um, the financial side, so a whole range of measures. Um, we also have a Wednesday morning, um, so that's the FDC exec team and our exec team, so we, we raise any sort of challenges on a, on a weekly basis there. Um, there's also a quarterly meeting that we, that we have with Councillor Philip and Councillor <coughs> Whitbread, so that's with myself and Sasha, um, where again we talk about performance on, on that quarterly basis. Uh, and Sasha we, uh, meets on a weekly basis uh, with Councillor Philip as well. Uh, and then moving forward as this uh, committee, um, and it was agreed last time, the select committee will be where that performance will be, then be monitored as we move forward um, into this, this year. So I think that's important to uh, 
highlight the, the, the level of scrutiny that's going on. <coughs> um, so what we've delivered in 2021-22, so I'll just pick out a couple of bits here. So one of the really important thing and is around apprenticeships. So we offered four apprenticeships um, within, within the market. We do still have some vacancies for those. So if councillors do know people in the community, please do send them our, our way. Um, but that's something that we've offered. Um, as I said earlier, it's, we, we're looking to um, increase the number of people that we actually employ within the team rather than utilising contractors, so creating that social value in terms of employment. Um, one of the big things that we've done is, um, and certainly over the last two years, is putting in place the right technology to, to, to um, follow and track the performance of how we're doing. And we can actually get that down to individual operatives, and that is then discussed at um, quarterly reviews um, with, with staff. So it's, it's all about um, a two-way conversation uh, around how people are performing. Um, and then probably the, the other thing to say is that we were profitable um, at the end of the year. So that, those are a couple of highlights there. Just looking forward uh, to the next 12 months, so as I say, we're looking to increase work um, and insourcing. I think that's important. Um, we're looking to successfully mobilise new work streams. So again, that from a reputational and delivery point of view, we want to get that right, and there's a lot of work that goes into mobilising services. And I think it's fair to... I mean, I've... <laughs> Very rare you mobilise a service and you get it right. So there, there always will be teething uh, issues. You know, when we started the housing repairs, there was issues. You know, it's how we work through those. Uh, nothing, nothing, unfortunately, is as smooth as we would all like it to be. Um, we're also looking at opportunities around external works. Um, so I'm sure you're aware that we can seek external work and additional <coughs> income which then the profit of which comes back to, to the council. So that's something that we're keen at exploring around partnerships and um, delivering with, with others. Um, the other thing we're doing, and you'll see us, um, should start seeing it coming out very soon on social media, is around reviewing our customer experience standards. Um, so we'd really encourage those who've maybe not had the best experience with us to, to get involved in that bit of work, help us to to shape the service as we move forward. And that's, that's looking really at generating a, a customer-focused culture and uh, you know, clear expectations of what it, will feel when you, what it will feel like to the customer when you call us. Um, and then, of course, uh, increasing apprenticeships. So we've got um, a couple more apprentices that we're looking to uh, embed within the team. So that, that's a little snapshot looking forward. And then the final slide is uh, just a reminder. So if, if there are any issues that you need to uh, bring to our attention, we're very grateful for those. Um, so if you go through the councillor contact at Qualis Group, um, we make sure that you always get the, the right attention that you deserve. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, Members, before we go into our discussion and uh, any questions, I would like to adjourn the meeting and stop the webcast, please. Yes. Uh, could you be kind enough and change name plates, please? For webcasts, thank you. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, uh, I'm sorry for, for the delay in that, uh, in that break in that meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. That was very interesting. Uh, and um, actually, Councillor Murray made uh, a little exercise which I found very, very interesting. He, he actually put on, uh, uh, on different groups, you know, a question about how they feel about callers. 
I was very strange because sometimes we think alike. I did more or less the same, but not on Facebook. I took in Walthamar Bay the, the cases I had, and I actually said, you know, followed them up to see. So something similar, but not at, the, at the, so wide as uh, Councillor Murray. And I must say, and I will give to the, the members to actually ask the questions, but I must say, they're not all gloom, to be honest with you. Some, some uh, in Waltham Abbey, uh, and I'm only going to say in Waltham Abbey, uh, are actually, they were upset about mainly parts, you know, so when there are parts, there are delays. But a lot of people said how polite the staff was and how good the, the repairs were. Some of them said differently, of course, and that is the concern, and I'm bringing it to you, that they're not 100% uh, happy. Uh, but mainly I found that the boilers, so I don't know what is wrong with the boilers or any parts, and that is mainly the delays. That's what I found. Uh, so I leave it to the members now of this committee, uh, Councillor Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Johnson, you mentioned um, repairs that need approval. Um, could you give some examples of the sort of repairs that need approval and whose approval do you get, which officers, which members, and why do you need approval, and um, who pays for the expensive repairs? If you could just cover those, please. Thank you, Chris. Can you, sorry, yeah, I'm back on. Thank, thank you for that question. So in, in terms of how that works, so the type of repairs that we'd need approval for are the, the type that are more expensive for what, so what I'd call major repairs. So they're generally over £600. So let's say, for example, could be a replacement garage door would be one example. Could be a replacement of a part of a flat roof. So it's anything that's over that, um, that price per property model that falls out of that. In terms of the, the approvals, so our um, main contact is the housing assets team. Um, so we actually ask for approval before then proceeding um, with, with those works. Generally, that's done really quickly, um, and uh, we, we then sort of carry on with, with doing the repair. In terms of the payment, so where those, where those repairs fall outside of effectively the, uh, the SLA, those are then, they are charged as an additional cost to, to the council. Because essentially when they're major repairs like that, those type of examples, they are almost sort of component replacements, so they are more major. So they are, they are a bit of sort of catch-up repairs, if you like. Would you like to come back? Yeah. I'll switch off. I mean, my, I, I thought Qualys was supposed to be an independent company. It was supposed to be sort of taking the work over from the council. It seems a funny arrangement that you have to come and ask some of the officers whether you can do a particular job. And that the council is still paying when we seem to have given you lots of money anyhow to, to do the job. Yeah, that, I mean, that's about managing the budgets, managing the resources that the council have. So in any commercial arrangement, there's always a cap that you can go up to before asking your client whether you can continue to, to do a set, certain repairs. So that's quite common out in the contracting world. But it's, yeah, it's about making sure that the council are happy with that and getting value for money. Isn't the difference here the council's paying for, for it? No, perhaps not. Councillor Lee? Um, thank you, Chairman. I just want to know, are we actually saving money now that we've got Qualys? I thought, one, we needed a better service, but I thought we had to make sure that we weren't overspending. So could someone explain to me then, are we saving money having all these extra people or not? Thank you. So the, the, way, the way that the... Uh, um, agreement was set up was based on the historic prices so in the example I gave on the slide um, so on repairs the council was paying 452 pounds I think it was per property so what was agreed was we would do that for 420 so there is a saving 
in that sense in terms of what we are offering. Similar, similarly with things like the gas, um, gas servicing contract, so we are doing it uh, slightly less than the, the previous contractor. So there are savings there that come up, they come through over time, they don't realise straight away. The other area that will generate savings over time is the more we do with Qualys, that spreads our overhead more thinly, um, so it becomes um, better value for money. But it's, it's, a, it's a challenging market, you know, so you've got to remember that um, material prices are going up, staff costs are going up because there's a real demand for people. Um, but um, So those would be the sort of key things that I would say. I don't know if Andrew wants to add to that. Yeah, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we actually had one of our, um, our monthly performance and strategic um, Qualys Council meetings this afternoon, and we looked at some of the performance information that Qualys shared with us. One of the stats that struck me, actually, was the uh, productivity ratio. So uh, when housing repairs was, was run as a council operation, the, the number of jobs done per operative per day was two. Uh, now it's four. So clearly there's a productivity gain as a result of the uh, uh, different ways of working that Qualys are utilising. One of the difficulties that we have, though, as a council is, is you know, unless we benchmark our service by going out to competition, we don't know what the market would charge for a comparative job. So it's two years since, you know, since we, you know, we, we were last mm -hmm. in that space. And unless we go to the market every mm -hmm. year in a... No, in, in a fair competitive exercise as well. It can't just be a sham. You know, we have to actually go to the market and, and ask them how much it costs them to do particular pieces of work that we don't really know. So one of the things that we're currently looking at is, is looking at benchmarking information. So that means using people like the Housing Quality Network is, is an organisation that we're approaching at the moment to try and get some of that performance information to make sure that we are, as a council, getting good value. And I think you know, it's important that we are able to say that. Uh, hand on heart. We've also done some other benchmarking information as well, which does indicate that uh, you know that, that the prices that Qualys are charging us are at market or below. So, but it is it's not without its challenges proving that. And as I say, unless you unless you've got a, a a willing supplier who's prepared to do the same job for you, and you know how much it's char you know, they'd charge you for that, then it, it's very difficult to say you know, whether that is. A competitive price. I say all we can do at this moment in time is use benchmarking information to make sure that we're in the right space. But it's one of the things we're currently working towards, and one of those sort of issues that we you know, we know that we need to get better on. If I could just add to that, a very I thorough answer. Um, just to point out that going through a procurement exercise is not a cost-free activity. Uh, going through a procurement exercise to see whether you're getting best value. Uh, costs quite a lot of money and I would just point out uh, what we're doing currently on the waste contract and how much that's uh, allocated for in the budget to show that it's not something that comes for free. Yeah, but sometimes it is important that you actually compare. And I think that's the point that uh, Mr Small was making is that there are more, there's more than one, no, I should, probably shouldn't use that uh, particular metaphor, there's more than one way to do a job. Procurement is one of them, uh, doing benchmarking is another. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, under key objectives, you mentioned insourcing. Would you like to um, explain the logic of that and the financial implications? Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so generally, if we're insourcing, we're, we're obviously employing people directly. So we're not paying another contractor's overhead, their, their profit. Um, and generally speaking, it means that we can deliver a, a better price uh, than you would in the contracting market. Now, that's not to say that we should insource everything because, you know, a good example on planned works, we, we, we subcontract a lot of that out because there's not always a sustained flow of that work. So what we wouldn't want is um, operatives who you know, didn't have any, any work to do because of the flow of work. So where, where it makes sense to, so things like repairs, um, that definitely makes sense to do more in-house um, because it actually offers that, that better value for money. Yeah, come back. That does beg the question whether EFTC should do more insourcing.
Uh, right. Uh, Councillor MacGyver. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I do have, I have two questions. My first one really is we hear a lot about, um, you know, lessons learned and, and you know, experiences, you, you referenced a couple, but surely many of those examples would have occurred prior to Qualys undertaking these works. And so were lessons not learned sort of when this was an Epping Forest District Council matter? It's just, just a, a, a observation mainly on the efficiency side of things, and I welcome all efficiency, of course, this is exactly what we, we hope will happen, but you know, housing repairs has been something that the council has been involved in for many, many years. So my question is just really, was information about lessons learned previously, have they been passed on and has, is that, you know, giving Qualys fruitful communication between the council and Qualys? And my other query was, I think the statistics are really impressive about the feedback and I think that's really good. But of course there is still, I think I worked out, there's about 240 sort of examples where people aren't happy, um, which is, I think is acceptable in a, in a large organisation. Of course, many of that is opinion. It may not be based on actual outcome. Some people don't like the outcome, but it is the stat satisfactory outcome from our perspective. When somebody complains, I'm um, reading actually a complaint from correspondence yesterday, um, there's reference that residents are contacting the council, but I noticed that customer feedback and stuff is actually to do with Qualys. So when somebody gets on the phone to the council and it's clearly a Qualys matter, are they transferred to Qualys and then that complaint is logged on the Qualys numbers or would it sit within the council's numbers? Because of course the council is the obvious place that a resident will phone. Thank you for that question. Um, so the answer is, so certainly where we are um, the sole, um, where we've had a service failure, that would come and sit with us. If, the, if they can't, sorry, if they contacted the council um, and that was the case, that would be directed to us. There are, of course, occasions where a complaint can be um, between two, you know, between the FDC and, and ourselves. So we would work. We work very closely on those complaints. And in that type of scenario, it will be the council who actually takes the lead on that complaint, um, supported by ourselves. So we've got clear root. If if it's us, it's it's our complaints process. But if it's a mix, then we work work together on that. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, if a resident's had an experience with Qualys and they want to make a complaint. If they phone Qualys, it would get logged on the statistics that we've just seen. If they was to contact Epping Forest District Council with a complaint relating to works done by Qualys, would that be logged on the statistics that you've shown, or would that be under Epping Forest District Council's customer service feedback? Uh, it, would, it, would be, sorry, it, would. it would be ours in that in that situation. So no, it wouldn't be duplicated. So we, we would we would take that. Yeah. Councillor Brooks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Firstly, I'd like to preface what I say with very informative, and I learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you. Um, by the nature of people, um, anyone who qualifies now for social housing is often a vulnerable person in many different categories. So you aren't just dealing with the cross-section of the Epping Forest population. So people are by nature often quite needy. Um, and, but what, one thing that concerns me, because we're only contacted as counsellors when people are unhappy, customer service from the quality staff, you know, the customer end, very good. Some of the decisions um, um, that are made on the ground and what feeds back to me is the long delays, a leaking flat in the Broadway <laughs> causing damage to the, <clears throat> the shop underneath. Um, you know, no one's come out in a week and then someone contacts you. Um, sometimes the decisions are difficult to understand. I recognise you've got to triage like the NHS have. Um, but I just feel sometimes what feeds back to me is long delays for small jobs um, and also um, some of your staff feeling that, again, informal feedback from my constituents, that they're given too many jobs to do in a day um, and how quite hard to, to meet the targets. So often when there's a problem and the constituent calls them back because the, they haven't fixed it the first time, 
a reluctance of the operative to come back because he's got so many other things to do. Um, and then the other comment I'd like to make is when I have had to call Mears at the weekend on behalf of a constituent, our criteria for vulnerable seems to be extremely high. Um, dealing with a family with a disabled child didn't qualify for no heating at a weekend and things like that. Um, she just said that the Epping Forest criteria were very strict. Now, um, uh, you know, some of them I did, did query, really. Um, so just would like your comments on some of those. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of vulnerability, it, you know, absolutely, we, we, we prioritise our service around that. So there are people with vulnerability, particularly around heating. You know, the service standard is that we get somebody out, you know, within four hours um, on those cases, within 24 hours, so as soon as we possibly can. Um, on the, on the, you know, the example of the, the leak, I mean, maybe if you contacted me private, we could look into exactly what's gone wrong there because um, I think that that's an important part as well I mean in terms of um, productivity so we don't just focus on that of course because actually the other one of the key measures that we we talk to operative is about is customer satisfaction so it, it does need to it balances off in effect so it's not just about get in do it quick because that's not what we want actually if we're coming back and we're we're, we're rushing around and not doing the job properly that's not good for productivity um, or for the customer, the, the end user. So it is very, very much about making sure that um, we get that right balance of quality and speed because actually we know people, there's a demand for the service. And as you say, we do need to triage and prioritise the, the, the resource we have. Can I come back with yeah, a second course. comment and question, really? <coughs> As you know, there's a labour market, you know, and you're dealing with people who probably can go and easily get some more money by working for someone else. So you've got to keep the staff happy. But what I'm interested in if, <coughs> is what do you think your typical employee who's seen a changeover, who's come over to work for Qualys now, might say about the difference? That's a really good question. Um, I think... I think culturally it's it, it's different. You know, we are um, a commercial organisation. I think you know they would see that we've put very clear uh, performance measures in place. Now, for the majority staff, I think that's I think they like that because, and actually, there's it's very few people who don't hit the target. So actually, they feel like they're achieving as well. Um, through, through our sort of model, whereas before they're, you know, they're working, but they haven't got that sort of framework in place. Um, I think it's always difficult because it's, it's change, and generally people don't like change, but I would hope, you know, in, 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 by this time people have, um, you know, enjoying working for us. You know, I think we've got a really positive culture within the organisation one that's very focused on, you know, delivering and, 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 and trying to improve. So I, I would say that our staff, are, you know, are happy on that basis. Uh, we are very soon going to do an engagement survey, so we will find out more. And, and I'm sure there will be some challenges in there that we need to, to, to address with people. So, so hopefully that answers your question. It's a good question. You mentioned uh, uh, about... Um you know, you said, uh, come to me if there is a problem. And we have done, uh, in, uh, in other circumstances, we have actually uh, asked uh, the, the portfolio holder to help, things like that, because we, uh, we, understand, we understood uh, the, the priority of it. Now, what I would like to, to see is actually that we don't have to actually go into these measures, but you take on and you prioritise instead of us pushing different cases, yeah. if you understand me. Uh, Sasa, would you like to? Yeah, I just wanted to add that about a month ago, I actually had a discussion with three of the operatives that came over and um, that chupied over from the council to ask them their view on how it felt working at Qualys now. And uh, one of the things that they were saying is that they really liked the technology that we use, they liked the uh, customer, the values that we had as an organisation, and actually there was much more pace about the work, which um, 
suited them better. They felt that environment suited them better in the council. So it was, it was quite a positive discussion. And I just um, thought it was worth mentioning that because that was a conversation I had about a month ago. Any more? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, Councillor Wixley. Yeah, I've got, I've got a number of questions to ask, actually. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> For, almost forgetting. Um, yeah, I've just got a number of questions. Um, the first thing is, I think the presentation was useful, so I'm going to ask if that can be included in the minutes of the meeting, which I think is normal anyway. Um, at the end of that uh, presentation, there was a contact uh, email address for councillors, I think. I just wonder if there's a phone number. Uh, so could we receive any complaints? Is there somebody that we can phone through to? So we do have a general inquiries um, uh, line as well. Um, but what we wouldn't want to do is put you through, through the call centre experience. So actually the best way is either e by email and then we can deal with that. And I know many, I mean, I, I talk with Councillor Bibra very frequently, so that you can also go through, through the councillor there as well, and, and we work closely on those. So, so, so we're, we're restricted to email in that particular case, then? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, as a matter of interest, so you've got 75 members of staff. How many of those were previously employed by the council? So I think at the moment it's about 25 that we've got who are um, Tupi from EFDC. All right, so that, that's quite a big recruitment process that you've gone through. Yeah, and that, and that is because of the increase in the number of um, what we've brought on, on board. So we've brought new services on board, um, new mobilisation of contracts. So that's why that's, that might sound low, but actually it's not that different from the original transfer of employees. Um, I think my... Sorry. <laughs> I think my final question is actually one which was submitted beforehand. We were asked to submit some questions to Sasha. I think mine was one of two questions, and that was about perhaps looking at the um, issue of getting this investors, uh, investors in people uh, uh, accreditation, which I know a number of companies have got, and it may enhance the uh, the public's view of quality. Because you know, from what I've read from the email correspondence, there are some quite serious complaints irrespective of what you've said tonight about the actual figures. Sasa, would you like to? Um, we, we have started the investors um, in people process. So we did a survey um, in the first year of Collis and now we're about to do a follow-up survey. And that is an engagement that will talk to all of our staff across the business. Once we get the feedback from that, we can see where we've moved, what the general feeling is and then we can look at whether we want to invest in going forward with that accreditation. It obviously has a cost to it, and it takes some time, but it's certainly something that we think probably is worthwhile doing. So, um, and we certainly we can feed back some of that survey results. I think that's important. Yeah, I, I think it'd be very useful to get some feedback on that as it progresses. Okay, I have two councillors and one uh, councillor from... <coughs> I will go first to Councillor Hadley. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I think there's some congratulations due here. I noticed that your um, customer satisfaction percentage is above target, and yet your actual performance is below target. Very enviable situation. Perception is everything. I hope you agree. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if this is a quality thing. We used to have um, a service, uh, because I actually used it myself once, where um, you could contact the council. I had like a 90-year-old lady that the, the roof had flown off her shed, and it was done via someone from the council, um, and you just had to pay for the actual stuff. Now, is that something that we still run? I mean, Holly may know. 
or does that come under our quality thing, or is it completely different? I just wondered if we still I'll have ask a councillor uh, Whitbear to answer this. Thank you, Chairman. And I presume Councillor Lee's talking about our voluntary action service, um, which is, um, yeah, there's a small charge for some work such as that. I'm not sure if it would quite go to repairing a roof blowing off. Um, Oh, OK. <laughs> but they do do um, garden repairs and, and kind of small jobs around the house for those who aren't able to. And we provide that service for tenants as well. I would note there is quite a long waiting list for that service. Um, but if there is anything that, that you'd like to see referred to it, do get in touch with me and I'll take it up for you. And I was going to say, Councillor Wixley, I'm very happy for you to phone me if you don't like email. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, Councillor Hib. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of examples that are quite specific, and I know you'll say you need to have more information. Uh, one is Sycamore House in Buckstill East. Uh, in 2019, the residents and the leaseholders were told that it was going to have to have a new roof that was going to cost £48,000, £3,000 each. Um, nothing was done about it, and then nothing was done about it. And the work was done in 2022. The roof wasn't replaced, it was covered over by a subcontractor from Qualis. So there was less work done for the same amount of money and the leaseholders weren't given uh, any sight of any quotes because it was then an emergency. So this is all a little weird and you'll have to look that up probably with more detail. And the other one is um, a resident in Buckstill East who uh, had a house broken into. She's been a council tenant in the same house for 20 odd years and the door was broken and a man from Qualis came round to repair it and said, no, nah, not a council door. But it was when she took over the flat. So from my local experience of Qualis dealing with people, it's, it's not particularly great. And I know you'll want more detail on all of those. Um, the other question I have is, um, why as councillors have we never met the chairman of the board? Councillor Philip? Uh, because you've never asked to. Yeah. Sorry. I you? have. I have never been asked to bring the chairman of the board to a council meeting. Um, that we talked uh, and introduced the background of the chairman board, of the board uh, when we went through the appointments panel and brought that to full council. Uh, at no point has council he asked me to bring the chairman of the board to come to any meetings. Okay. Please do it now. Anyone else? Councillor Brooks? If it's all right. <clears throat> you showed us some very interesting figures about tenants who'd obviously been saving money and not switching the heating on until that cold snap started. Um, now that, and how it resulted in an absolute flood of calls. Now, what I'm not quite clear about is how much you use Graceland's and compared with how we use them in the past? I mean, I can confirm we don't use Gracelands in Qualis. We have historically, but we haven't for a number of, number of months now. So how can you cope then with such a flood of, um, if, you know, these spikes are going to occur again next winter? But, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, so, so one of the ways is um, utilising a backup contractor if we, we need to do that. Um, but actually we've increased the resource by one extra person, um, so that person's actually now being recruited to, to help with um, some of the, um, I suppose, ripples from that demand for the service. So we have increased that resource and we've also temporarily re increased the resource within the call centre as well. Um, although calls actually have levelled back out now um, to sort of the usual type of levels. So, yeah, often it's around trying to get some temporary resource or permanent resource in um, to make sure that we, we can cover all of the service that we need to. I have a question, actually. You mentioned Amazon Connect. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about it and how you said it's about the residents as well? So do you make sure that the residents know about this or how does this work? 
Um, so thank you. So essentially, it's a, a web-based product. So it's it's um, it doesn't have any sort of hardware at all. So it can be used remotely. So sometimes our call center uh, operatives are, are remote rather than being in the office. So there's that flexibility. Um, so, and that's good from a sort of business continuity. It's, you know, backed up in the cloud. So if things went down, we would be still be able to receive calls. So that's an that's important thing. And it has all the things that a call center function would have. So all the call recording, um, we can, we've got KPI, so we can monitor average call times, all of those things. So it was all about improving the, the, the customer experience. We had a legacy system. Um, which didn't give us that, we didn't, we didn't get the call recording, we didn't have the stats. So it was a really important um, measure that we put in place to, to improve the experience for the customer. So what is internal use? No, so, it's, um, so that's when you call in, that's the system that we're <coughs> utilising to handle all, right. all of those 24,000 calls. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, Councillor Lee? Um, thank you, Chairman. Just following on what Rose said, um, who services the boilers then in the, the properties, the council properties? Surely they should be serviced every year and then you wouldn't have all these boilers that broke down when winter came. So is that part of Qualys or is that something else? So, yes, we serviced them. So we took the uh, contract over from um, Gracelands in, on the 1st of April last year. So, yes, we undertake the, 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 the servicing. We also do, uh, we have an independent auditor that goes out and does checks on those to make sure that our operatives are doing everything in, in the correct way. So, yes, it is an annual service. It's a, uh, a legal requirement that, that that happens, that the council provides that uh, for, for its tenants. Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wasn't actually going to uh, speak tonight, but I've been sitting here listening, and as somebody that spent their life, their career working in the construction industry, there's just a couple of things I'd like to say. Um, after every contract, we had a lessons learned session, and every time we all learned new lessons, even though the work was very similar. Um, construction is not a, a science. Um, there, there, there are always things that are different, different sizes, different problems. Uh, but on Sycamore House that Councillor Heap mentioned, uh, the re one of the residents did get in touch with me and I went through it all and found them, I can't remember now, it was a 20 or a 25 year roofing guarantee. So it wasn't uh, a, a quick fix, it was a proper job with a proper guarantee. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Patel. Thank you, Chairman. So just a really quick one in terms of customer survey, and I know that was emphasised quite a lot in our select committees, etc. So how do you correlate your customer survey versus Epping Forest one, and how do they c come together? Thank you for that. So the, the way our customer survey works, so every completed repair, where we've got valid contact details, so that's generally um, a mobile number or email address, um, our Connect system sends out an electronic survey which then fires back in to, to the system. Now the, the survey that um, the council is doing, so that is a new regulatory requirement um, around, um, I think it's around the, the consumer standard, so it's a requirement for all social housing providers to do that, so that's going to be done on an annual basis. So that is that will be a, a different focus because um, that would be a perception survey rather than a transactional one, which is the, the, the survey that we send out. Okay. You would like to come back? Sorry. Yeah, just um, so that I'm assuming then you would follow up on that perception survey as well. And if there was any lessons to be learned from that, it will get incorporated into your own survey. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll be working closely with, with colleagues um, in the HRA. Um, to pick up any themes and, and look at areas that we can improve. Um, so that will be happening at some point this, this year. Perhaps I can actually ask Pam Morf if she could actually help us on the EFTC side. Yeah? Yes, yes, Chairman, thank you. Um, 
we will be doing this survey in the in the next 12 months because we have to gather this information. It's right to do it anyway, but also because we the regulator will expect it of us. Um, some information Qualis already collect, but when we do the survey, we'll sort of go beyond that. And also, some things will be similar to what they check, so we'll be able to corroborate whether you know, what they're finding is the same as what we get or similar to what we get when we go to the whole tenant body to ask them what they think. So um, the, the questions are prescribed by the regulator, obviously, because they want every um, social housing landlord in the country to ask certain questions in exactly the same way. So the other benefit, I think, for councillors will be that, that it will be very easy to compare, you know, what, what we're doing what Qualis is doing and how we compare to other authorities. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, uh, both, uh, thank you very much, both uh, uh, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Jarvis, and uh, for all the information. And hopefully, we learned and we heard quite a lot. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we will be in a position to answer some of our residents' uh, questions ourselves. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Of course, you're welcome to stay. We say that to everybody, but I think <laughs> you'd rather go while we continue our uh, meeting. Okay, um, we go to item 10 which is corporate plan key action uh, year five, quarter three performance reporting, and that is pages 23 to, 20, to 52. Um, Councillors, uh, I hope you have read your, I do always encourage everybody to read uh, your um, agendas. So we're going to take it uh, uh, page by page. And if you have hopefully any questions, please, uh, ask the questions as we go along. Okay, so we start with page 26. Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, housing Asset Management System. You have a green for the first quarter, then you have two reds, the second and third. I mean, how have you gone from green to reds. Yeah, Pam, it's your, your turn, I think. Today. Yes, thank, thank you, Sharon. So um, the project um, was has been fully reviewed because of that green going to red and not meeting certain milestones. So we got an external review of what we were doing and then what we sat done is sat down and reprogrammed the whole project, um, which means that instead of being delivered in April, it will uh, be delivered in October of this year. Um, and obviously we're not happy that we've um, had to delay it, but um, I'm now the project sponsor and I think that that's the right thing to do. And the work that we had done by this uh, external expert on Civica, which is the system that we're implementing, uh, was very detailed and went through every single module. Um, and so I think we've now got an achievable plan and you know, the proof will be in the pudding, but the next monitoring you will have and that we get monitored by the council's um, project management uh, section as well, and I'm accountable and I have to go there quite rightly every month to, to talk about progress. And so I think, you know, the, proce the processes are in place to monitor our delivery of this project, but we have had a major hiccup and we have completely had to revise our delivery dates. Okay, on page 27. Councillor uh, Heather. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, no, I was, I was still on page 26. So okay, I'm apologize. sorry. That's uh, right. It's just in status. Um, the project will be rebased in January 2023. What does rebased mean? Does it I mean back to square one or it's going somewhere else? Sorry, no, that's what I was just saying. So we've taken the whole project and looked at the new timeline, and that's the new timeline will be till October. Okay, page 27. 
page 28. 29, 30, 31. Excuse me. Yes, Councillor Whitley. Yeah, I, I have just got a question on page 30. Um, the waste uh, management contract. I just want to clarify it. Is, does that end on the 4th of November? Uh, 2024, because my understanding was that it was going to end this year, but it seems that we've still got a long way to go with the current contract, and given the recent difficulties, uh, I hope things can run uh, quite much more smoothly up until the 4th of November 2024. Yeah. We'll ask James Warwick to actually answer this. James? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, cu the current waste contract runs until November 2024. Right. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Chairman, if I could possibly come in there, because uh, with, along with Councillor Avey, I was on the Waste Management Partnership Board uh, today talking exactly about the performance of the contract. Yes, um, they have done a lot of work very recently to update things. They have new uh, freighters coming on board. Uh, they've identified new uh, lorries which they've procured for the, the narrow areas. They swapped out the way they were doing that for three separate streams and they separated it into single streaming. Um, it looks as if they, if they deliver on what they said they were going to do today, then things will be better. I can say from my own point of view, from my own ward, uh, the Biffa lorries were out there on Sunday catching up with the, the, the backlog. Uh, I didn't expect them on Sunday, so I ended up uh, running down the road after them with one of my trial blue bins uh, to make sure they collected it. But the good thing, it, for, as far as that's concerned, because they seem to have more or less caught up with the backlog, there shouldn't be the excesses that they had to deal with before. So it sets them up well. They talk a good game on whether they can uh, do it or not. I'm willing to cut them another, another little bit of slack and hope they maintain the level that they're at. Yes, please. Well, can I ask another question on this? Because it's a question that I'm being asked by at least one resident. Uh, in view of the poor performance, <coughs> um, are there automatic uh, penalties in place, or is that a matter of negotiation? The issue of not performing to what the contract is is a very uh, detailed and subtle argument. Um, I'm sure Biffa would be the first to say that they performed as best they could given the circumstances that they found themselves in with uh, vehicle breakdowns, with, as has already been alluded to, uh, staffing difficulties given where they are. One of the good pieces of news is that when they agreed their last pay settlement with their staff for, for the Epping contract, they've actually got that agreed for next year as well, from, from April, so that's already baked in. So. Whereas we're seeing in some of the other places around the country, uh, the waste contractors going on strike and having issues from that point of view, n not collecting any waste, we know that with BIFA that shouldn't be the case. Um, in terms of uh, money back, what I really want is not so much more money back, but I actually want the waste contract to be collected as it should be collected and, and take that forward. In the global scheme of things, what's actually being missed is not a significant impact on the overall cost of the contract. Um, and from my point of view, if I got 20,000, 30,000 back, I would just be spending that immediately to make sure that we had a better service. Uh, and that would probably be going back to Biffa because they're our contractors at the moment. So let's make sure that they deliver a good service. Uh, and we, were, we are, as a cabinet, making sure that we're as well positioned as we can be for when the negotiations go on for the next contract to make sure that we're set up to get as good service as we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I understand that, but my understanding was that um, a few months ago when there was a problem, the council had to employ extra people on the telephones to answer all the queries, which did incur a cost. Um, so I would have thought at a very minimum we ought to be able to claim that cost off them. Ch 
Chairman, I'm not, I'm, 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 not yeah. going to, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into negotiating on the BIFA contract in, in the council chamber. Um, rest assured that we have very good officers. We've got James on the call yeah. uh, and David Marsh who do a really good job at making sure that BIFA are doing what, what they should be doing as far as possible. They've been working with a very difficult situation at the moment. As I said, what I want, and I think what all our residents want, is a reliable, regular uh, refuse mm. service mm. picking up both the waste and the recycling. And if we can get there, as we, and let's not forget that we were one of the very few councils in the country who actually managed to keep our waste service running successfully without a hitch through the COVID pandemic. The last year has been bad. I will not deny that. Uh, it'd be silly to, I, I miss my waste being collected as much as anybody else does. But what we need to do is make sure that between us we get successful collection for our uh, residents over the next two years. Councillor Lee. Now I've got a very strange question, James. I'm hoping you can answer it. Today, uh, walking from my house to Tesco, and your microphone, if that's all right. Today, walking from my house to Tesco's, which is not a very long journey, um, I had to walk to the edge of the pavement because bins were there because it's collection day, and the biffa lorry came up and pulled alongside. Now I've had my hair cut since this morning, but this morning my hair was I was like a wild woman. And the wing mirror brushed the top of my hair. Now, I'm not very tall, so is there not a standard height? We all know the big lorries have got great wing mirrors sticking out, but is there not a standard height they should be? Because if I'd have been any taller, and especially at the moment where I'm unstable, I would have been knocked over. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, what was that? And it was actually the mirror on the biffer lorry. So is there some standard on it or not? So you're lucky that... I'm here tonight. <laughs> well, well, we are happy that you're here, and you are one piece, and your your hair looks lovely. So James, <laughs> so James, perhaps you can actually. Yeah. Um, apologies um, for that, councillor. I will I will raise the issue um, first thing tomorrow with Befak. Um, I'm not aware that there are is a, a certain height. Um, that they need to be, but certainly driver care and um, people's safety is paramount. So the driver shouldn't be drive, um, driving so close to the pavement and especially when people are there. So I will raise it um, with Biffa. Thank you, James. Councillor Murray. I, I'm on page 31, but I don't think you've quite got there yet. Which page are you? I'm sorry. 31. Oh, 31. On, yeah, yes. Are you still on 30? or? No, we're going now to 31. And just to bring to members' attention that I'm, I mentioned the, the minutes, and you can see that the minutes <coughs> said that it was the 1st of April, and here we are on CPP 054 is saying that it, it is the 17th of April. So we changed it to April the month, you know, because of the, the date. The, but please, you know, we are on page 31. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for letting me speak on this item. Uh, it might seem an odd comment, but I'm very unhappy that this is on green. Because uh, everything that has happened since this decision has been made, for me, calls into question that this is the wrong decision but I understand the Cabinet has made it, so we are where we are. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm happy that it's on schedule and on time because I just think it's the wrong decision and everything we've learned subsequently uh, about Qualis and transferring services to Qualis uh, calls into question that decision, I would say. Councillor Philip. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm really happy that this is on Green because I'm quite convinced that it's the right decision. It's a good thing for our residents, a good thing for the Council. Um, I'm glad to see that it's on schedule. Uh, having committed to do something, it would be a great pity if we weren't on schedule trying to do it. Um, and we're going through the, this, this, the stages of making sure that it happens successfully and delivers what's required. There will be definitely uh, brought reports to uh, select committees about the ground maintenance uh, in due course. Ch Chairman, the grounds maintenance came through uh, your committee already and we no, made no, a decision. No, no, sorry, excuse me, not for the decision, 
but for the progress and uh, you know. I, I will be I will be reporting back where appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? No. Uh, right. Page thirty-two. It's 32, yeah. Councillor Heather. Thank you, Chair. Um, only just on the, the sponsor for the North Hill Master Plan. Has that been changed? Has somebody been reappointed for that? Talking about Mr. Dorr. Yeah, could you? Yeah, could you, Georgina? Uh, yeah, I just uh, spotted the very same thing. Thank you very much for highlighting that. Yeah. We will, of course, change the sponsor. The moment it's myself. Yeah. Yeah, of course there will be uh, the correction. The, uh, Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to note that the, the report um, represents the data from Q3 and was um, completed yes. and submitted before um, yes. we were of an updated situation, so we will make sure that that's reflected in the Q4 yes. report. Yes, we understand that. Chairman, if I can also add that uh, we still have Darren Goody on there as well. And yes. I, I, work, I, meet on a, I meet on a regular basis with Darren, so I, I, from, from a cabinet point of view, I'm well on top of this one. Yeah, lovely. Okay, page 33. Page 34. Page 35. Page 36, Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, customer services, I notice that the target is 45% and you've been hitting over 70%. When will you move the target up to somewhere in the 70s or even 80s? Or reduce staff, one of the two? We'll ask, uh, I'll ask uh, Rob Pavey to actually answer this. Yes, we will. Um, thank you, good evening, members. Um, yes, we will certainly be moving that target up um, to make it um, it's, as we seek to continually improve service. So we will certainly be making that a challenging target for us to achieve for the following year. Certainly um, above um, the well above 45 percent and up to where the and then 70, maybe 80 percent for next year. We'll, we'll take a review of that when we get to the year end, but certainly to, to, to continually push that target. Um, so, so it makes sure that we're providing the best service we can. Uh, would you like to come back? Uh, no? no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor MacGyver. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's uh, related to page 35, uh, same uh, KPI reporting, though. Um, when we mention overall customer satisfaction, I just wondered if Mr. Pavey could just clarify is that the customer saying, um, thank you for trying to help me, but I'm just not happy with the outcome? Or is that a measure also of the way they've been treated? Because there's lots of reasons why the score may not be um, in the green. However, mm -hmm. people could be complaining about a horrific incident that affects everybody um, in the district. But if they're treated in a way that they feel satisfied, they may say, well, the person on the end of the phone was very helpful. I wasn't happy mm -hmm. with the outcome, but they were, did their very best to help me. So I just want to clarify, when you say overall customer satisfaction, is that with the service or with the outcome for them personally? <laughs> Okay. The, the, the overall refers to the, uh, there's a number of channels that we measure that customer satisfaction through. Um, it's web, it's email, it's, it's telephony. And um, so I think that's, that's what the overall refers to. And it will refer to um, a mixture of things. It will refer to how they've been treated, you know, and I, I you know, obviously that's uh, the key to that, that they are treated in a, in a, pro a professional manner and a helpful manner, courteously. Um, but also, um, what we find is that they, that they may not get the answer they want. Uh, and that may be, I don't know if I take the waste thing as an example, we're increasing the number of phone calls. The, 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 the person dealing with them might be happy, uh, happy with how they've dealt with, but they couldn't provide them with the answer they wanted, um, such as when will my bin be collected next, and obviously as soon as possible. Um, and maybe, maybe pushing for a, a, firmer, for a firmer commitment on that. So um, that's, uh, that's the sort of thing. Um, that, that happens um, around that. Um, and of course, um, the web will be, um, for example, if they couldn't find information they wanted easily, or they you know, they didn't like the way the, 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 the web form was, et cetera, or found it confusing. So there'll be a number of different factors that build up to that overall customer satisfaction. 
I think it would be. Um, yeah, that, that's that's what the overall refers to. It obviously, as, as a council, unlike Wallace, for example, we don't um, ask for someone every time someone receives a service from the council, um, such as uh, gets a planning decision made or um, or they um, have a benefit application process. We don't individually ask each time they receive a service from the council as the satisfaction. This relates more to how they, when they contact us or we contact them in, in some context, such as an email, and how they felt they've been treated or dealt with, do you know what I'm okay. If that helps, Councillor Carl. Would you like to come back or you're okay? Yeah, all right, thank you, thank you. Okay, we go continue page 37. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for letting me contribute on this item. Uh, quarter three. Uh, I, I would imagine this is a question for Jenny Gould. 22% uh, increase on the same period last year, uh, numbers of homeless approaches. I know that's not the same as uh, accepting a responsibility, uh, but why that fairly dramatic increase? What would be your uh, uh, reasoning behind that? I'll ask Jenny Gould to actually uh, answer this. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, we do have the data that sits behind that, actually. So what I can do for the minutes is um, ask the team manager to do a report on the reasons for homelessness so we can see what's driving that increase. So um, that will come out with the um, minutes of this meeting, if that's OK. Is that OK? Yeah. Anyone else? Page 38. Page 39. Sorry, Chairman, I did have one on 38. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I, I think it actually probably refers more to quarter two than quarter three, but it's something about community additional provision in the summer months. Uh, I think we're likely to see that go down because I don't know whether members are aware. Uh, Play in the park is really successful. Uh, we're asking for a 40% increase in the uh, amount the parishes pay, and the parishes paid a uh, significant contribution, which I don't have any problem about. Uh, uh, and in fact, I've commented on, on the good cross district council parish work in, in providing that service, but I did think a 40% uh, hike in, the, in what we were asking in, in one year is uh, was a uh, very unfortunate. I, I understand, and again, I, I obviously don't know for certain, but our town clerk reported that uh, uh, Epping Town Council, on that basis, had decided not to take part in play in the park. And I know that in Loughton, and Councillor Wixley is the chairman of the appropriate committee in Loughton, so he can correct me if I've misremembered, uh, but we've decided we can only do half the number of uh, play in the parks. So I just, you know, that, that number of participation will, will go down. I did, did think it was... A, I understand an increase, but I did think 40% increase was, a, was rather strange. Jenny, would you like to... I know it is Jilly Wallace that uh, she's actually uh, in charge of this, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've made some changes to the to overall to the um, programme that the Community and Wellbeing Service delivers. Um, and of course, in having done that, we'll be monitoring that quite closely and looking at what's popular, what's not popular and making adjustment as we go through. So, um, yeah, I absolutely accept that point. And I think it's something that we need to keep a very close eye on over the course of the next 12 months. OK, continue to page 39. 40. 41. 41. Councillor Brooks. I'd just like to make a comment, really, <coughs> rather than a question, okay. but for noting for this uh, as we're a scrutiny panel. We're up against a massive back. Um, shortage of swing teachers um, and they are tr working hard to train more teachers but I am still regularly getting complaints from parents about their classes being cancelled particularly at Loughton um, or merged in the higher stages really I know they tr they're trying hard to address this 
by subsidising. Um, but this is a real cash cow for the contract to bring in the, as many children on those swimming lessons as possible. Apart from the fact it's really great to have so many children learning to swim. But for instance, the teenage swimming things for children who can swim quite well, um, we haven't had any since last October and parents were promised them for January. But in fact, there's no teacher to, to run the courses. So now they're saying perhaps February. But it's so important to keep children active, particularly mm. in the teenage years, when there's a massive drop-off in physical activity. So th this is an area I know James knows my passion for. Yeah, we had our uh, uh, partnership meeting uh, where you brought it up. Uh, James, perhaps you could actually... Uh, or uh, Councillor... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to yeah. come in, Chair. Lovely. Um, yeah, as um, Councillor Brooks said, we had our Leisure Management Partnership Board. Places Leisure um, are doing all they can to recruit swimming teachers and train them up. It, it is quite a lengthy process um, because of um, training them, getting their voluntary hours, and then um, actually getting them their DBS checks back. So we have a number of swimming instructors that are ready and have accepted hours, but we're just waiting for their DBS is to be um, to be returned, which we expect in the next week or two. So that will help with future programming. It's an ongoing process for Places Leisure, so they're continuously recruiting, but um, it, and it's something that. We, we're doing all we can to work um, work with Places Leisure, um, getting them access to the schools, getting access to college, but also um, with the connections from our community hub, with job coaches and the job centres. We're, we're, yeah, we're looking at every avenue possible to recruit staff um, to the leisure centres. OK, thank you. Right. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Okay, continue, page 43, page 44, 45, 45, Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair. At the top of page 45, uh, what percentage of the rent due for our council home tenants was paid? 100.2%. That's more than you've got tenants. <laughs> Still your typo. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pam, um, would you no, it's, it's not a typo. It's just that we've co collected more than the rent debit. So we, so it's, it's also recovering other monies from previous years. So it's, that's why we've collected more than 100% would be the whole rent debit for that year. But when you've collected more, it's 100.2. But it is strange to see over 100%, nevertheless. Okay, uh, page 46. Page 47. Oh, I beg your pardon, Councillor Brooks. Page 46. Well, just to reiterate, and we all know all the reasons why, but the planning, it, um, you know, the sooner we can get the long, long, long awaited local plan through, the better. Because that is something I do get moans about, the delays in the planning um, and people waiting for their applications um, to be passed, etc. Yeah. I'll ask uh, Nigel the Richardson to actually uh, have a, tell us and try to convince us. Nigel. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, the local plan's getting there. Um, we're not too far away. We've been working with the inspector and uh, so we're pretty confident we will have a sound local plan in the next uh, couple of months. So that's, that's a good news. Um, the policies in the emerging local plan are being used. We can give considerable weight to them. And in fact, we have been doing as part of our decision-making process, um, as you will see at uh, planning committee meetings. Um, in terms of the performance, um, yeah, we're still on red for the minor and other category applications, but it has improved. If you recall, we had that delay where we couldn't issue planning permissions for a, a couple of years. We're through that now. We've, uh, we've removed the backlog. Um, 
And perhaps what those figures don't demonstrate is, despite the percentages slightly improving, there's quite a considerable number of planning applications dealt with in Q3 compared with Q2. So, uh, but yeah, officers extremely busy um, going through the churn of planning applications. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Brooks, would you like to come back or? I know that we used a lot of agency staff at one point. Is it looking a bit better, um, Mr. Richardson? Yes, the, um, we, we have less agency staff now. I suppose, the, well, the good news is we seem to have, especially in the development management team, um, staff that have been with us for a number of years. So they know the local area and the district pretty well. Um, we did have, if you recall, we brought somebody in to clear the backlog of planning applications that are held up by this um, air quality issue on the forest. We've now uh, let that person go um, because we, we felt we don't need, need that resource anymore. So uh, at the at present, we, we feel like we can cope with the uh, number of planning applications we've, we've got. Of course, when the local plan is adopted, we'll anticipate some rather large planning applications being submitted to us. So we'll have to take stock of our resources then. And in fact, we hopefully will be relying quite a lot on something called planning performance agreements, which we can uh, uh, sign up with developers if they're willing to do so, where hopefully we can bring some additional resource in. Councillor Brooks, yeah. We continue uh, page 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. Okay, members, thank you very much. We go to item 11, Chairman to report on the select committee business, pages 53 to 60. And we start with the work programme of Stronger Communities and to Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, the team, the, the officers in that work very hard on this team. Um, and as far as this goes, you can see most of the things are completed. Um, the only thing that I personally would like more work done on is with the, the housing associations. But um, until I can start driving again and whiz round, I can't get all the proper facts, but I'm still getting a lot of complaints um, about work not being done. And I know there was a new white paper and what have you from the government where we can get landlords and that to do things. But until I can actually go around and check myself that I'm getting the right information, I don't feel like I can chase that up. But um, apart from that, I think um, everything's sort of going as it should. So I'm quite pleased with how everything's gone. Councillor Unless Murray. anyone's got any questions, they can ask Jenny. <laughs> Councillor Murray. <laughs> Uh, mine, Chairman, is just uh, a, a positive comment. I am capable of being positive when there's something positive to be about. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, how much I enjoy Councillor Lee's chairmanship of this uh, committee. She does a really good job. I mean, she has a unique style, uh, but uh, thank you, Councillor Lee, for the way you do it, because you, you make it interesting. Well, not only you had two, com two comments now, one for your hair and one for your chairmanship. Well, <laughs> you must be very, very happy. Okay, uh, we go to, sorry, to our Stronger Council and Councillor MacGyver. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the work programme is obviously very self-explanatory um, as per the agenda. 
Um, I just did want to mention in our recent meeting just last week, we had a, and I'd like to just make a point of mentioning, uh, because it came sort of as a product of discussions at your committee here, um, the employee wellbeing hub here, um, members of, of my committee were extremely impressed with the, um, the, the facility that is available and particularly the notable timing of it. And uh, as scrutineers, we often talk about things that maybe could be done better, but I think here is a, an exemplar of something that couldn't be done any better and if in actual fact is setting um, the standard rather high for similar authorities and similar organisations. And I would argue that actually it's very rare that we see the public sector um, organisations perhaps setting an example for private sector organisations. And I, I just wanted to really praise all of the officers and teams who have um, been a part of the Employee Wellbeing Hub. We also had a very um, interesting uh, presentation of the onboarding and induction uh, program and also a new portal that's been created for people that join EFDC and I just think it's notable that uh, Councillor Heavily has suggested that it also be made available to members so I look forward to seeing how that may um, roll out in the future and of course on a very serious note we had um, the draft budget report for 2023 and 2024 it was another opportunity to thank all of the team within the finance department and indeed members of the cabinet who have been working very hard on producing that budget uh, through very difficult circumstances um, so I, I, overall I would say it was actually a very positive meeting um, considering some of the sensitive nature of the matters we were discussing Okay, Councillor Murray. Yeah, I would agree with everything that Councillor McIver has said, apart from, from uh, one point, and even at this late hour, I do listen carefully to what he said. Uh, in my experience over 40 years, I would say the reverse is true. I tend to find that the public sector sets standards and models that the private sector could follow. Uh, the reverse, in my experience, hasn't been the case very often, but it's the public sector that sets the standard and the good practice is... Uh, because he said it was the other way around, but you know we can have different opinions, but uh, or different experiences. But my experience is is com completely the reverse. Would you like to answer this? Yeah. Councillor Murray has been on this planet for a lot longer than I, so I will not not dream of uh, 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 disagreeing in public. But I'd be happy to take that conversation up in private. Okay, lovely, accepted. Okay, so we go to stronger place. And Councillor Balcom. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we've got one meeting scheduled left on the 7th of March, which on the agenda we have sustainable transport and an update on the local plan. So we're up to date, but questions were asked about the work programme. One was the climate change okay. action plan, which was due to be heard by the committee. And Members asked when will this be coming to place and if. And the second question was raised um, whether um, place was the right place and could we put on the agenda um, for the following year um, planning. Okay, good. Uh, Andrew, would you like to. I'll go somewhere. We can certainly have a comment. Sorry. If you switch off your. Happy to have a uh, conversation with uh, Councillor Balcom about how we can engineer that. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Right. Uh, item 12, Overview and Scrutiny Committee Work Programme, pages uh, 61 to 62. Councillor Murray. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, one comment on something that is here and then one comment on something that isn't here but that will make sense when I explain. Uh, it's the very last comment, uh, and I am only one person. That's uh, uh, a nice thing about being an independent, so I might have missed it. But transfer a service to Qualys to pre-scrutinise the business case for the transfer of MOT and fleet. Has that been on any other agenda in any other guise, or is this a, a, a new issue that's... Uh, uh, coming before us because it says cabinet decision to be confirmed. Uh, has, has this been on agendas up till now and I've missed it? or uh, And then I might have a follow-up question on that. Yeah, Andrew will answer this. Thank you, Chair. I think it's been talked about in connection with grounds maintenance, uh, specifically because of the use of the depot that, 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 that the air grounds maintenance service operates out of. 
I think if you, if you recall in the grounds maintenance transfer report, I, th I think it was agreed at that point in time to, to put any proposals or any discussion around MOT and fleet on hold until a better understanding of how the grounds maintenance service was operating under the new arrangements. I'm absolutely right that we do scrutinise it. I can't help thinking that it's uh, what I fear in virtually everything's going to go to call this apart from the things that legally we cannot transfer. Uh, but that's, you know, we're, we're going to uh, uh, scrutinise it and that's the right thing. And then the other thing I thought I would report on, because you're quite right, Madam Chairman, we now focus our scrutiny on internal matters. But one thing that was on our... Uh, external scrutiny list for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and we quite rightly took it off, was to uh, scrutinise this, uh, how the uh, uh, Epping Forest 6 1 consortium was uh, operated, because uh, okay. it's been going for eight years, and quite rightly we decided to take it off. But I thought I would report uh, or remind members, first of all, that. Though that's the legal entity, in reality they have always operated as separate six forms. And I just wanted to report to members that if they hadn't seen it, uh, Rodin Valley Six Form had its first offstead of its six form just before Christmas, and it got outstanding. I don't know whether Debden Park and Epping St John's have had an offstead or not, otherwise I would uh, report their six form outcomes. Uh, but we were, we were really pleased to get an outstanding in a, in a large new sixth form. I obviously do have to declare a, an interest as a member of staff. That is not surprising in that uh, Road in Valley is actually an outstanding school with outstanding <coughs> teachers as well. Uh, uh, Councillor Brooks. Just to say, uh, though we haven't confirmed a date, I'm very pleased to see that um, uh, we're going to look at uh, scrutinising the operating model of the museum, particularly with all the changes. Yes. Yes, it is very important. Councillor McGarver. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is uh, for something that's not currently on the work programme, but I, I feel it's important. I did want to raise it. Um, it's regarding communication that we receive as members, um, uh, as councillors. Um, and often I feel that local media outlets are becoming, you know, like member briefings. Um, we often find out about matters um, when they have on, on social media or through the press. And I feel that as elected members, on certain matters, we should know about these things in advance and have some pre-warning. And the council is capable of doing that because we're all quick to get a text if there might be a problem with the IT department or something. So it was just something I wanted to, something I've experienced today where I, was, I felt quite embarrassed as a councillor because I didn't know anything about it as related to my ward. Um, and I think as councillors we are expected and to be good in our function as councillors we do need to have knowledge, we do need to have an awareness of what's going on and there is an expectation of residents that we know exactly what's going on especially within our own wards. So it was just something I wanted to bring to your attention. It may be something for my own committee to look at but I felt this was the appropriate place to bring it up. Yeah, yeah actually if uh, you could have a conversation that's exactly what I was thinking <coughs> with uh, Andrew. Yeah, about uh, council on my. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, one Chairman. Second, one second, oh, sorry. sorry. On this subject, yeah. uh, council with Brett. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chairman. Now, I apologise to <coughs> Councillor McIver because I think I know what he's relating to, and I had tasked officers and Councillor AB to brief all the councillors. Right. Okay. Chairman, if I might as well, the, the, the majority of um, press incursions are either down to uh, the press releases which are sent out from our PR uh, group who will al who also send them to councillors uh, or from published agendas and we also get informed by email when those agendas are published. Uh, mm. if, if people out there read them more quickly than our councillors do, I'm not sure there's a lot I can do about that. One second. Uh, Councillor Murray, sorry about yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chairman. I, I didn't know Councillor McIver was going to bring this up, but I would endorse what he said. Uh, and I think there's a wider issue around communication, because uh, I have to be honest and say I don't think our communication uh, has been particularly good uh, around the Biffa crisis. I know, I know there is a lot of good work done by officers in trying to deal with 
the situation, and I have nothing but credit for that. But, but it wasn't clear uh, what uh, members of the public should do on missed collections. Should they leave it out? Should they take it back in and then put it out on the next rotation? So I think there's a wider communi communication issue. I I'll give you another example, and there may well be precise reasons why, uh, but I know that the key people, and we know who the key people are, they're opposite me, uh, they met with Biffa on the 12th, and there seemed an interminably long delay before that was communicated to the general public on the 23rd. So the meeting was on Thursday the 12th, and the <coughs> communication with the public uh, was uh, the Monday week following that, the 23rd. And I felt during that period of time, uh, there was a lot of disquiet in the local community, and if we had had that communication much earlier following, and I accept there may be complicated reasons for why it couldn't have been done any quicker. It would have been better for, for everyone all round. So I think sc scrutiny of the communications would, would be a, a good thing for us to, to look at or the appropriate committee. Okay, Councillor Woodburn. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I think there's two types of communication. The one that uh, Councillor Phillips has just said, which members are fully able to receive. Order, if they're receiving their emails, they should be reading their emails, I hope on a regular basis, therefore they know what agendas are out there and what information is in the public domain. Press releases come out to every member um, and therefore members have a duty to keep themselves up to speed with what's going on. Um, on the other hand, there is communication sometimes, as I've just explained with Councillor Giver, where members or officers are asked to make sure ward members are kept involved with what's going on. And then there's the more complicated, as with the BIFA relationship, which um, Councillor Phillip really explained well earlier on because he's had a further meeting today. That particular meeting was um, at the height of the, the biggest problems that we'd had with Biffa and the collections. And of course, most importantly, was getting the actions in place that have helped to uh, get the collections at least started to be caught up, even though I'm still not happy yet. Um, but um, helped to make the progress. And to be honest with you, we couldn't get any communications out any quicker. Um, because if we did, they wouldn't have been agreed between both parties. So there's always a reasoning behind everything, and uh, I think there's always lessons to be learned on communication. They can always be clearer, they can always be better, they can always be sharper. The world is moving very quickly. No one, no one takes anything in until they've read it eight times. Um, and, of course, it's always difficult in these days of Facebook blogs that have taken the place of good local press, um, and the way that some people engage on those, those Facebook pages. Mind you, there have been the uh, circumstances where we were um, uh, called by the residents to say they have not collected the recycling, what shall we do? Shall we pick them up? And it was very difficult if, you know, to say, no, don't do anything just in case you know, they come and collect them another day. This is a very <coughs> difficult situation to be, Councillor Lee. Um, yes, I, I received my cabinet papers this afternoon um, and I actually was reading them for the first time in ages and I noticed there's a load of pinks um, which we're always told pinks, we don't discuss it elsewhere and yet it's already on Epping Forest, uh, everything Epping Forest. Um, so I just wonder why, what's the point of selling us pinks if it's already out in the public domain? Okay, Councillor Woodburn. Yeah, thank you Chairman. If the members reading their agenda, of course, you'll see that the, the title of the um, uh, report is on there already. And what isn't there is the body of the information of the report. And, of course, it's badly reported, as usually usual. And if there's an attempt to be made to find out what it was actually about, um, we wouldn't have been so badly reporting, causing concern on Facebook again. And perhaps I could just add to that, Chairman, to say that the title in the agenda does not match the title on the report on the pink. In other words, you can have the agenda because the agenda is public, but the, the contents of those reports do not appear uh, in public. Yeah? Not the ones. Okay, anything else, members? Thank you. Right, we go to uh, item 13, cabinet business, which is pages 63 to 80. Okay. There we go. If we go straight to 
69. Uh, Councillor Murray. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Just information, please. Uh, when are we expecting the uh, final uh, uh, proposals uh, from the local government uh, boundary review? Okay, Councillor Wigbrett. Chairman, early March. Early March. Okay. Anything else on this page for the leader? Okay. Page 70. Page 71. Human Finance. Page 73. Page 74. Housing. Page 75. Internal Resource. Councillor Mare. Five, please. Uh, the uh, pay strategy approval by cabinet of the pay strategy. Uh, is, is that going to involve any any moving away from national agreements? Councillor Kane. No, not at all. It's the, uh, the the mandatory statement that needs to go out on our website and just uh, dictated our pay strategy, and will be as per normal. Councillor Murray? So, as a trade unionist, there's nothing there for me to worry about. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, uh, Bates. That is it, really. <laughs> okay, members. Right. Item. Item 14, exclusion of public and press. And so, therefore, we close the meeting at, uh, at 20 minutes past nine. Thank you very much, all of you.